interesting subsurface in which to vibrate the colors from. colors, you know what I mean by fauvis, the French term fauvism. Welcome, welcome to the show. I am Jeffrey Hill, your host of the show. And today is a beautiful day. It's sunny and shiny outside. Lots and lots of smoke from forest fires over in Oregon. But here in Idaho, we're super excited. Why are we? Because we're on the show. And besides that, and on top of that, and the extra little nugget of funness today, is that I get to introduce you to one of my best buddies, Daniel Kathalinas. Daniel is an artist who travels all over the world from sunup to sundown, looking for the coolest, nicest, most inspiring views to paint. He takes like this mortarboard, I don't think he wears the plaid jacket, sort of like my flowery coat here, but he takes the mortarboard, the big huge easily, sets it up in the middle of somewhere, and he paints. And it's so cool because he's done this in America, he's done this in Japan, overseas, he's done it in Albuquerque, New Mexico, New Jersey, where they speak with a New Jersey accent. Is that how they speak, New Jersey? They still speak English over there, is what I've been told. So today, you can hear him snickering in the background there. I'm going to introduce you to my buddy Daniel Kathalinas, the roaming artist. Why is it roaming? Because he goes all over the place and paints. He's roaming around painting. He's super awesome and he's full of wisdom. So you gotta pay attention, watch, learn, experience the art, and fall in love with Daniel Kathalinas. Right after this, poof. Are you looking for ways to make more money? Are you good at sales? Do you have the drive and the ambition that it takes to get the job done? Well then come join our team here at TVPBN. We offer great incentives. Work your own hours from ever, wherever you want. Small town, big city, my favorite, the quiet island beach. It all works. Go to TVPBN.com today. Click on the link to become an affiliate. My name is Chris Mayberry and I'm excited to be working with you. Welcome back. You can see Daniel on the screen right here. There he is. It's so cool that he's here. I'm going to sit right down in the chair right back here. Don't trip on myself. Daniel, welcome to the show. It's so cool that you're here. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's a blessing to be here today. You're down there in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I say down there because, well, it's south of where I'm at. Is it hot today? Oh yeah, it's about the mid-90s so far, and uh, although the heat is really penetrating, the light is amazing here. I would think that with the light being as incredibly bright as I'm sure that it is, wouldn't that create harsh lighting conditions as opposed to a nice mellow golden hour? It does, but what it also creates, and, and I noticed this when I came off the plane once from New York City, how cloudy it was in the summertime and I arrived here and I got off the plane and I was like, oh my gosh, this is bright, this is yellow, and it also enhances the oranges and the shadows have incredible color in it. And the sunsets here in Albuquerque, oh my gosh, absolutely amazing. Red, much like what we're looking at back behind here, this is the Sandia Mountains, also known in English as the Watermelon Mountains, of Albuquerque and the sunlight is, this is how I perceive it, very penetrating. And when it comes in over uh, the volcanic area um, to, the, to the west side of Albuquerque, looking towards the east, because the sun is setting, it lights up those mountains generously and they become fuchsia and orange and peach colors. Almost some colors that I can't quite find in paint. Really, now you said that it, you even see colors in the shadows, and I never thought of that before, because when I look at my shadow, it's just a piece of black that follows me around and never gets rid of me. How, how, so the sun is so bright you can see color through the shadow? Yes, in Impressionist painting, 
the shadow work is actually the complementary color of the light source and the, the subject matter color. So in other words, it blends the light source and the subject that it's shining upon. And the shadow is the complementary colors of those colors. And you can see it really clearly here in the desert light. Uh, even though it is harsh and intense, when I actually cover my eyes like this, and I look at the shadow of a particular object in the sunlight, and you can see the blues and the, the purples and the violets just start to react. And it's like it's like there's colored lights shining, creating the shadow then. Yeah, yeah, well, the sun is, but the sun is also, well, we would see it sometimes as yellow or orange and sometimes even mm -hmm. whitish purple. But it has its own color source. And when it's reflected on other objects, those colors, those reflected colors, are within the shadow. So that's kind of like when you shine a light through a prism, it separates and you can see the rainbow. So the same yeah. thing happens as the color, as the light hits the object and bounces off of it. I'm, I'm guessing then it's sort of the same, same thing as it's reflecting and, and hitting that shadow. It's, it's mm -hmm. splitting the beam. That exactly. the, it's splitting the angle the of incidence or whatever you call it. Yeah, it's splitting the beam right to the complement on the other side of the color wheel. It's a very fascinating concept, and it, it works. It worked for the Impressionists, and it works for me. Do you only see this when it's really bright? Or, I mean, here in Idaho today, there's so much smoke from forest fires that, you know, you can't see the sun when the sun's up. But is it... Only on bright days that you see this when it's really harsh, harsh, bright lighting? No. No, it's there whether uh, we acknowledge it or not. I think it's more enhanced and it's more noticeable in the desert bright light. I am really going to have to go out and look because now I'm wondering if you've got some sort of secret spy artist glasses and mine are <laughs> like uh, monotone. They only see, you know, <laughs> rose colors. Well, that's the uh, beauty of a real, of a good art school. They will not necessarily teach you how to paint or how to make sculpture or make film. They teach you how to see. That and is that exactly, is the, I believe, what Rembrandt was talking about when he painted the shadows more than the light. Uh, that's Isn't right. That right? Yes. Yeah, they, they, they teach you how to see, how to look at things differently than how we just take maybe even for granted. So I remember before I was in art school, everything was black, everything was white. Um, there was very subdued colors. But as I began studying color theory and painting, I started to learn that there's multitudes of colors within the color itself, within the one subject or one particle of that subject matter. Um, it's really what the Impressionists were, were working with, and the Expressionists learned how to take it from outside and bring it inside and then spill it out upon the canvas. That's, that's a whole different level, too. How can you not find a certain color? You, you said that a minute ago, you're, there's colors here you haven't even been able to find yet. I mean, you've got a whole palette of color. How can you not find a color? What happened? Do they like get sold off to the... Middle East or something? Well, the, th the thing is, um, when we're looking at, for instance, this one here, right, the Sandia mountain range, uh, that color that in every day is different, every moment the light starts to change. So it's like it takes a real mixer to understand the, that what type of color to get for it. So in other words, the color is not necessarily a tube color. It takes some experimentation and mixing. Ooh. And, and that's what I'm referring to. It's not necessarily something I can buy. I have to actually mix it and, and learn how to make that color. Because you're not actually, you're not looking at that, you're not squirting stuff on a, on a mortar board in a precisely measured amount. Some of the artist in you knows that you squirt this much, you stir it this much to get that result. And that's half of the art right there, is being able to figure that ratio out every single time consistently. Yes, that is the skill of, of painting. And many times I'll work in, in different directions. So in other words, sometimes I will take the paint and apply it directly to the canvas, uh, which you'll see in The Roaming Artist. And then I will place layer upon layer upon layer or stroke upon stroke 
to change that color and, and allow the colors to react to the, each other because they, they don't stay sa- stable. They actually vibrate. Your eye is receiving this light and receiving this color and it's vibrating in your senses. And that's the key to mixing. It's not just mixing on the palette, but it's also taking it, once you've got it on the canvas, you can get further to another layer of mixing and enhancement as well. I can understand that because you might mix it here and it might turn out yellow. And then you start applying it over here with some blue. And next thing you know, what you had was yellow is now a color of green. Yes. And then you could take that green and you could put a light layer of something else over it, like a purple, and see what happens to it. And, and not just that on top of it, but you could put, place another color next to it. There is a famous painter, a famous artist really called Joseph Abers. And he had uh, created a series called The Homage to the Square. He basically just took squares and he did one color of, let's say, for instance, orange, and then he would take the other square inside of a square, and he would make it uh, green and take another smaller square, and he would make it another color. But what he was doing was working with the vibration of color and the color relationships between each other. And when I take that particular yellow that he may have used, and I place it next to a blue, it may look very different in vibrancy, and intensity than it would next to a violet or a dark blue or a Prussian blue or something to that extent. So the colors themselves are like relationships. They react to each other when they're near each other or overlaid upon each other. You know, I've noticed that in film. If you project an image onto a white wall or a slightly off white wall, your colors will appear to be different. And it's the same reason why if you look at your TV screen or your laptop that you're looking at right now, on the edge of it you can see that it's black rather than white. And that's because the way the black interacts with the other colors on the screen makes it appear to be more vibrant. As opposed to mm-hmm. if, the, if there was a white strip around the screen, your eye will adjust and it will seem less vibrant. So uh, filmmakers and anybody who makes monitors want you to be able to see the greatest depth of color so they put that dark strip around the edge so that your eye mm. compensates. It's a, a, a trick of light, I suppose. I want to talk more about this, but right now my mom is calling me. So let's <laughs> hold on one second while I talk to my mom. Ready? Poof. On the show with me, Jeffrey Hill, we are always looking for new people to come on the show as a guest and share their stories. I love to talk to actors, singers, producers, filmmakers, authors, and tons of other people. If you or somebody you know would be a great guest for my show or any other shows on the network, just go to tvpbn.com forward slash the show prep and fill out the application today. I look forward to seeing you. There's my friend Daniel Kathleenis. Before we get back into what we're talking about, I wanted to mention something. Just now on the commercials, you saw a film clip and it said, your turn, the turn. This is a film trailer from George Harrington. On October 20th, 2021, you need to tune into TVPBN and experience the full breadth of the Harrington experience. Be sure that you have your seat belt on your seat. Make sure you've got someone you can hold hands with because Harrington makes some scary, scary films. I will be there hosting the premiere that evening of the 20th of October, and you've got to be there. Now let's get back and talk to Daniel here. You are currently in Albuquerque, 
But where were you before? What did you just spend the last three months doing? Ooh, let's see. Um, last weekend, I spent some time in Santa Fe uh, filming the Roaming Artist video series there and painting. Um, prior to that, I was in, let's see, Arkansas, Alabama, uh, Georgia, Lookout Mountain, Mentone, uh, North Carolina, Asheville. I was in Virginia Beach. Uh, I was a bunch of places. I seem to get around. You told me a oh, story. Oh, LA. About... I was in LA recently too. <laughs> oh, that's a big one too, because you have a show coming up in LA, I believe. I do. Yes, two of them. Which? Uh, what date is that? Have you got that set yet? It looks like, um, and this is not fully locked in, but October seventh, I'll be in San Pedro of this year, uh, doing the first Friday at a place called Mike Rivero's Gallery. And then 2022 in October, or sorry, 2022 in May, I'll be in Long Beach at a gallery called, uh, why it's slipping my name. Oh, oh, it's um, Halata okay. Gallery. Halata Gallery, that's Halata Gallery right there, where they have a lot of, they, they have a <laughs> lot of paintings okay. from a lot of awesome artists. See, that's yeah. cool. Now, you told me, you told me, see, the reason you can't remember is because you've got a lot of these shows. That's the problem. Yeah. yeah. When you have like, only one show, it's easy to remember the details. But when they're starting to pile up, it's hard to remember. So you told me a story about when you were painting in the rain. I think this was in green, green someplace. I forgot. You, mm. And I thought, what an amazing thing. You're going to go paint in the rain? Like yes. Mother Nature do the painting for you? Yes, exactly. Uh, the painting that I was working on is called the Rain Assisted Painting. Um, it will be in my newest show called uh, Between Masks and Transfiguration, this one here. Um, it's actually going to be physically in Albuquerque, uh, although it'll be a virtual gallery walk this Saturday at 1 on Facebook Live. But um, the Rain Assisted Painting was done at the Norfolk Botanical Garden. And I just drug this big canvas out and I wanted to allow nature to work on it. So I would spread paint upon it. Of course, it didn't work in torrential downpours, but it would work in drizzles and light rain precipitation. And the rain would come down and just move this paint in ways that I can't move it. The water is breaking the acrylic color down. So it's flooding it in certain areas and leave level it, like uh, levying it out to different areas. Uh, so I had a real lot of fun do you, doing it. Do you just put the paint like flat on the ground or are you putting it on an easel like this up, the painting, the I was, canvas? I was putting the canvas right on the ground and pouring paint on it, let it take effect. Then I would bring it inside and then I would do that multiple days of rain. Anytime it rained, I would drag this painting out and sometimes I would mask out certain areas. So I would just take a, a big piece of plastic and tape certain areas out because I thought, ooh, that is fascinating. I really love that particular left corner of the painting. So let me mask it out and then allow the rain to work on the other parts. And then you would just pour paint on it, just squirt the little acrylic tube right there on it, and then just stand there. Pretty much, yeah. But I would also uh, move it sometimes. So I would take the painting and then... Uh, tilt it one way and it would drip one way into one section or another. Uh, so there was limited work that I had to do with it. Um, mostly Mother Nature had helped create it. She was my partner on this. What, a, what an incredible partner. I mean, look what she does in nature in the first place. I'm really looking forward to seeing this. You said this is going to be available to see on the virtual gallery tour this coming Saturday, the 24th of Ju July at 1 o'clock, right? Yeah, one o'clock uh, Mountain Time, and it's a Facebook Live event. You can find it just at Virtual Gallery Walk, and the actual show exhibition name is Between Masks and Transfiguration, although the, uh, the headline is actually Virtual Gallery Walk. Yes, if you scroll down on the uh, TVPBN Facebook page, you can see the post that talks about the, the mask, I can't say the word again, tra the ma what it <laughs> mask and... Ma between masks and transfiguration. There you go. Between I keep thinking there's something between the mask, but 
then I got the, the words all mixed up. Yeah, scroll down the page right there. It says that between mask and transfiguration, there's the information. There's a link on there, and we'll put the same link in this post that we'll post today. I mean, people who are watching this think we just posted it. Because, well, we did. You're watching it, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we'll put that link there. This is super, super cool. So how big is this natural painting? I mean, is this like little, how big is this canvas? Um, if I am not mistaken, it's about 36 by 48, somewhere around there. Like the one that you're sitting in front of. Uh, this, this one is 60 inches by, uh, 36, I believe. This wow, was a three feet tall, five feet wide. Yeah. This one is a commission work. Um, uh, it's very interesting because the person that wanted to commission the work She's having a house built here in Albuquerque, and she had showed me all these. She came in and she said, stop painting uh, because we have to get the color swatches for the bedroom set. And I thought, oh, my gosh, do I have to repaint this? You know, because she had the, the color swatches. And then she came in and she was comparing the color swatches to the painting. And I thought, uh-oh, I hope I have the colors that she wants. And what she said was she is actually making the bedroom suit to match the painting. So that's just a blessing and, um, you know, to, to come to be able to do my work and have people really touched by the work is, is very important to me. That's probably more important than the painting itself. I think that really makes more sense because how could you take a scene like the Sandia Mountains right there and then suddenly say, oh, let's just highlight the pinks more because the bedspread is pink. That doesn't make yeah. one bit of sense. I mean, just look no. at it, it's so vibrant. And on top of that, there's so many colors in there anyway, that why would you have trouble matching anything? There's like 16 million colors in that painting. <laughs> You're not far off. <laughs> it's ex <laughs> extraordinary. And now that you've explained how you, how you blend the colors, starting on the mortar board and then on the canvas, it is extraordinary how you manage to get the yellows right across the top of the mountain. And uh, one of these days, you're going to be here in my studio and you're going to show me how this is done. And I'm going to try like the Dickens. That's like a really lot of trying. When you try something like the Dickens, my mother said you're as evil as the Dickens. And that meant I was really, really bad. So I'm going to try like the Dickens to match the colors and blend them like you. And Man, that's, that's just pure art right there. It is, um, in some ways, I think, the way that we will think. Uh, in other words, the way that I perceive myself as limiting sometimes doesn't work for painting. I find that children that have no limitations, that are very excited about what they do, they attach immediately. Most kids just jump on this thing and they learn fast. And parents and, and adults can do the same, but it's all in perspective. Where we're coming from, from the inside, what, we're, what we perceive is ourself, what we perceive can, we can do. I believe if we think it hard enough, we could do it. And if we also do that thing, we could grow that thing, no matter what it is. It's like practicing a workout or working on a particular muscle group. As we continue to build it and practice, we just get better and better. And it's amazing. So I believe that art is uh, two things. Number one, it's a spiritual a process, no matter if you're spiritual or not. I think there is something connected inside you that connects with the artwork. And it's also a muscle that we get to practice and learn and develop. Interesting. Well, they say practice makes perfect. So what you said is exactly correct. It goes right along with that. That age-old saying, practice makes perfect. Yeah, I haven't found the perfection yet, but I think uh, I could come to some acknowledgement of what's finished or not. <laughs> well, that's half the fun of it, you know. You keep on looking yeah. for perfection your whole entire life. I, I have a theory on that, and that, that the artist searches for perfection year after year after year. And when they finally find that piece that they say, this is my final masterpiece, this is the one, all of a sudden they lose that desire to create because they found their perfection. Hmm. So let's hope to heck that you never find the perfection because you would stop creating this beautiful stuff. 
Yeah, I believe that's true. I think when you ask an artist, what's your favorite piece or what is your best piece you ever made? And most of them will say, well, the one that's on the easel now. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the <yeah>. new one. <laughs> the latest one. Buy now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm okay with that. The latest one. I would love to have that one sitting in my living room right there. Three feet tall, five feet wide. It would fit real nice in a beautiful frame. I have no idea what kind of frame I'd put it on, or maybe no frame at all, because what kind of frame would you put around that type of a painting? I don't know. It wouldn't be very good with a gilded frame. That's a good question. And actually, this is made not to be framed. So she requested that it be three inches thick. So this is a very oh, seriously? thick. Yeah, this is a very, and you can see this is a handmade stretcher as well. So up here, this is all handmade board that I had someone customized to make for her. So it was, wow. it's not meant to have, yeah. Holy cow, that's interesting. We're walking around in the studio garage. Yeah, the so, studio garage. <laughs> oh, look, another one. What is this? This is, that's a painting I was working on um, on the same patron's back porch. And I was so taken by the morning light because I was hiking around um, out there in the Sandia foothills. I got this great view of the morning sunrise. And it just inspired me so much. I was like, I have to paint this. So she's like, well, use my porch and paint. I said, okay. So I started using her porches and painting. <laughs> how do you remember when you're taking a walk like that, you see these sunrises, these sun, how do you remember this? Do you actually take a picture with your phone so you can look at it later? Or is it just embedded in your head? No, I, uh, I, I do take a picture. I think about it. Um, I like to look at it with the heart. So I do practice meditation, so not just with my head and my thoughts, I look at it with my emotion and my spirit. And uh, that this particular painting, or these couple of paintings really, I needed to work right there on the spot. Uh, so I basically pack up a bag, which is the roaming artist bag that I carry around with me all the time. And I have my canvas and my tables, and I just whip it out. I pull it out of the car and say, all right, let's paint, it's time to go. And when I get that feeling, it's so important to act immediately and not wait, never waiting for inspiration. I found that there is no non-inspiration because there is so much to be inspired by. The more that I look around, I'm just in awe at the beauty and the majesty of this place and the people and the culture and the, and the activity that's happening. I get a chance to react immediately if I want to. And it's also a decision not to if I decide well, I want to go watch Netflix or I'm going to go look at my email or something like that. I mean, that's a decision too. But I have to be ready because the inspiration is always there. I just have to be open enough to see it and react in time. Could you say in that regard then, because you're talking about spirituality, could you say then that God speaks to you at all times or whatever you refer to, deity speaks to you at all times the failing is not in that God isn't talking. The failing is that we're not listening. That's beautiful. And yeah, I would agree with that. You know, my higher power, my source, my God is all the time there. I have a decision and a choice to make whether I want to plug in or whether I don't. And it doesn't make me bad or wrong or, or it, it may make me ineffective as an artist, as the artist that I've grown up to be. It makes me ineffective when I'm not plugged into the source. And why wouldn't I want to be? I mean, if I, if I think that there is a source, why wouldn't I want to be plugged into it? Would I want something else? I feel like um, I've come a long way in my own spiritual uh, relationship with what I call my higher power. And it's not um, necessarily dogmatic, but it's very personal. I think that is really a key thing. It, was, it would be a question of, do you plug into the, de the, to the higher power? In other words, if you were saying to yourself, I want to become super rich. And so then this millionaire comes to you and says, I will help you be super rich. Just listen to what I say. And then you're like, uh, 
How about next Tuesday? Can I get an appointment? Can you put that in my calendar, please? Wait a minute, you know. <laughs> and then you complain, oh, God didn't make me rich. And yet, he delivered the information, and then you made that choice to not listen to the inspiration at that moment, which is why you carry that bag with you all the time. I mean, like, I'm guessing you probably take it when you go to Walmart, it's right there in your car. Yeah, anytime I go on a trip, even if I don't use it, I have it with me. It's important. So whenever that inspiration comes, you can capture the scene. That's right. And what you just reminded me of, Jeff, is uh, the story about the man that's in the flood, right? He, the, the whole town gets flooded, and he's up on the roof, and the water is rising up to him. And he's like, God, help me. He's praying, help me with this situation, help me to live. And this rope gets thrown from across the way, and, and the people on the, the shore are saying, reach for the rope. And he's like, I can't reach for the rope. It's too far away. I'm praying to God. And then a couple hours later, the water's still coming up, and the boat comes by and says, jump off the roof into the boat. Jump off the roof. And he says, no, I'm too scared. God, help me. God, why won't you save me? And the boat goes on by. Then the helicopter comes, right? And the helicopter is hovering above. Grab the ladder, dude. Grab the, grab the ladder. And, and he's saying, no, God's going to help me. And then he dies and gets to heaven. And he said, God, why didn't you help me? He said, man, I sent you three chances to get up on there. <laughs> so I believe that my higher power moves mountains. But I got to bring the shovel. I have to take some action and decision making in my own process to begin this, this whole new way of life. Yeah, the success is in the doing part on the human end. My dad always yeah. says, God cannot drive a parked car. You have to get out and start doing something. And that he will direct you in your doings if you will simply listen to that inspiration on the direction of which way to go. And so here we are today. Now I have a video clip here I've only been able to see a few minutes, so this is a brand new experience for me, and I'm very excited to share it with everybody. What is this video clip, though? It's, what is it? Uh, this is one episode from The Roaming Artist, which is my YouTube channel, Episodic Adventure. Uh, this particular video clip is from Santa Fe, just this weekend. All from one weekend? All from one weekend. I run around with the camera and paints. That's what I do. <laughs> Holy smoke. Because, see, I watched 3 minutes 54 seconds until my connection at home started buffering and making me angry. And I felt like after only 3 minutes 54 seconds, I'd taken a week-long, two-week-long trip with you in the mountains in, in New Mexico. That, that's, so we, we've got, I've got like, what, seven, eight more minutes left on this? It's about 11, 12 minutes long. Let's go mm -hmm. take a look and enjoy this adventure. Santa Fe, New Mexico, I've never been there. No. I'm artist Daniel Kathalinas. Let me take you on a trip to discover art, culture, and people with passion in The Roaming Artist. Welcome to the world famous Cowgirl restaurant here in Santa Fe, where you can get some delicious green chili cheese fries. And burgers. And burgers and everything to toot your whistle. San Miguel Church, the oldest church structure in the United States, created in 1610. I think the only thing that might outlast that or come close is San Xavier del Bac, which is in Tucson, but the structure was actually burnt down. So this one is still existing and still around for us to see. Just about 20 minutes outside of city center, get a chance to walk the riparian trail of Little Tosuki Creek Trail. And a riparian environment means that it is water-sustaining, life-sustaining area uh, that is really good in the desert zones. 
and allows other trees to grow and wildlife to flourish. Look how green this is here. I wonder if this is a native snapdragon. Wow, this is just super colorful. I love it. Paintings without painting, the natural life of the lichen and the strata of the stone is absolutely wonderful. Um, the texture, the color, the presence of this rock. I really want to input that in some of my work. Great views from up here. Wonderful. I'm here with my friend Aaron Levitman from Santa Fe, yes. and uh, he's such an adventurer, doing a lot of things <laughs> with uh, film and and uh, playwright, right? Yes, playwright, uh, virtual theater, live theater, you name it, acting, writing, marketing, producing. It's amazing. One man show sometimes. I started off with the Santa Fe Film Festival actually um, probably about 17 years ago. Um, right when I moved from Cape Cod, I saw that they were looking for volunteers and I always loved film festivals. Um, I used to go to them regularly uh, when I lived in Boston and then New York. And so I volunteered and I sort of fell into this great group of people that were working there at the time. and. I uh, was the volunteer coordinator there for, I think, for one or two festivals, uh, two consecutive years. And then uh, over the years, I kind of fell out of touch with them. And then um, when uh, it's actually great that we're here at the Jean Cocteau Cinema, because how I got reinvolved with them again was that I, um, this theater was bought by George R. R. Martin, and I applied to be their uh, programmer. And they said, well, we're not really looking for a programmer, but the Santa Fe Film Festival is, and they do uh, screenings here. So I got in touch with the board of directors there, and they uh, hired me to be the head of programming. And so I did it for six years. I, you know, I've been writing plays pretty much my whole life since high school. I've been involved in theater my whole life as, a, you know, an actor. And uh, I've been, you know, having uh, pr primarily one act plays produced at different festivals around the country. And uh, I would say within the last few years, I've had a lot more success with it and have gotten into a lot more prestigious festivals. Oh, so I just had something published in, uh, in London by uh, a publishing company called Smith Scripps in the UK. And um, the last year, I produced a virtual uh, theater uh, program uh, called almost for my company almost adults productions and we produced uh, LGBTQ themed short plays on zoom Beautiful. and we involved uh, audiences in town from all over the world because it was virtual there's no limit so it's great so your creativity yes and what you write about I'm yes. very excited to hear uh, what's under the hood for Aaron and what gets you juiced up to write the next play oh uh, that's such a complicated question sometimes I'm never sure like when I write a play and it, especially if it comes out very quickly I never quite know why this particular subject enabled me to write a certain play over something else mm. that I might think is interesting and not actually write a lot of times it's people I meet you know like I'll meet somebody that I think is really interesting um, I'll give you an example um, the last play I wrote um, was about an exterminator and we uh, had a, unfortunately we had a need for an exterminator in our house a couple years ago. And this guy that came just took, he was just this interesting guy and he, he would keep like following up with us and I just became intrigued by him and wrote a play about him. For reasons I don't, I'm not really clear. exterminator. I knew something about his life, you know, because he was kind of a talker and then I, you know, invented a lot of things and created a relationship, you know, between him and the, the main character that whose home he was coming to exterminate and so it, you know, I think what, what else I'm interested in is sort of writing about characters that don't normally get addressed in theater. Mm. You know, more marginalized characters that I don't see a lot of representation from. And here in the back of the theater is the George R. R. Martin dragon popping out of the side of the building. Look at that. Interesting.
I am here at the beautiful Cathedral Basilica of St. Francis Assisi. It's a Roman Catholic church. It's just steps away from the plaza here in Santa Fe. It was built in the 1800s, and it's on a much larger site of an original church built in the 1600s. Just about a week and a half ago, I was at the Getty Museum in LA, and I had a great opportunity to sit there with my friend Diana Opencaru, another artist, and examine the cathedral painting that's there by Monet. Now, Claude Monet had a series of wonderful cathedral paintings, which he started outside. He started looking at the cathedral. He was doing sometimes inside hotel room and outside, and he was taking a good observation of what the cathedral looked like. And then, for many months, he worked in the studio afterward to try to regain some of the feeling that he remembered there. And that's what I'm working with here, is taking this cathedral and having a lot of fun with it. Taking it in, examining what I'm seeing, and changing it up a bit, almost in a neo-expressionist way. Meaning that neo, intensified color, expressionist from the inside out making the forms, the shapes, coming out of me as I'm looking at the, the subject matter that I'm looking at. And uh, I'm working with complementary colors. So I'm doing color opposition. In other words, I take the opposite of the color wheel. If I see a light blue sky, I'm going to go in with some orange and some dark reds. And I'm going to make the contrast on the painting. So that way I'll have an interesting subsurface in which to vibrate the colors from. colors. You know what I mean by fauvist? The French term fauvism meant wild beasts. These were painters like Matisse and others uh, that had worked in high cued, really intense colors. And that's what I'm working with here. Just enjoying the ability to get the emotional color on the canvas. Not necessarily the representational color, but the way it feels. I like to think of it as emotional exploration. What it is to have the emotional landscape. So I take in what I'm seeing, and then the important part is what am I doing with what I'm seeing as an artist? That is the pleasure of painting. It's not so much about what color I'm applying in the realistic format of the imagery I'm creating, but it is in how the colors react to each other. How the layering, of one color on top of another pushes and pulls each other away or apart or right to each other like magnets. This is uh, some of the basics of color theory and working in complementary colors you will see that the yellow is also juxtaposed with the purples and they push and pull each other and allow the colors in a relationship to vibrate. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button and let YouTube know that this is quality for you. Also feel free to join as a subscriber to my YouTube channel. It's free, you just gotta press a button and you're on. You'll get all the updates of The Roaming Artist. But if you really want to become part of the art, join me on Patreon. It would be patreon.com backslash Daniel Kathalinas. That'll bring you right there where you can take a look at all the artist perks that we share together as a team to help make these videos and other artwork happen. I hope you have a great day. Remember, art is part of the heart. Thank you.
Yeah. I think I muted my mic. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I literally found myself lost in the paint as you're doing the overhead, uh, the GoPro shot from overhead painting the church. When you explained that you were using the, the, the opposite colors on the color chart, and I looked at the sky and I went, wow, that's right. If you take a blue sky and you reverse it, you invert the colors, it turns a different color. All of a sudden, the whole painting just comes alive. And then, it's, and yeah. then it just, all the, the time lapse part, I literally fell into it in awe that you can sit and see the colors like this because I'm looking at that church going, oh, wow, that's really nice. Francis of Assisi. Okay, that's really cool. It's just brown and there's a white sky in this video. Wow. I, Thank you, I, don't, I don't see how you see that. It is... I just found myself lost and I wanted to look at it more and more and more. And those of you who felt lost in the paint just like I did, make sure you go to Daniel Kathalinus. That's K-A-T-H-A-L-Y-N-A-S, DanielKathalinus.com, and get one of these for yourself. Because if I fell into it so easily on a video shot on a phone, how much better is it when you own the original or at least the G-Clay version, surely. Incredible. I just don't, I'm gushing on this thing. I mean, how, how can you, I mean, you had, you had paints over here on, on uh, paper towels, and you just kind of like, I just think I'll put some blue here. <laughs> I'll put some red here. But yet, look what it did. The same thing with the Sandia Mountains in the background there. I'm in awe, honestly. Thank you. So you, you have a show this coming Saturday, the 24th, the virtual exhibition. I'm assuming that at the show, you people can buy these paintings, right? Yes. Actually, this is a pre-show to the opening reception. So on Saturday is the virtual gallery walk. And if anyone's interested to purchase a painting, they can. That's probably the best time to do it because the live in-person opening reception will be the following day here in Albuquerque. So you're selling the originals for many, 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 many thousands of dollars. But <laughs> can they purchase a G-Clay version? You're not supposed to laugh at that because it's true. Can they purchase a G-Clay version? <laughs> yes, they could purchase a Z-Clay version of any of my works. So it's a little and more affordable, and yet it looks the same. It just doesn't have the texture of the paint. Right. You won't see the texture of the paint, but uh, the Z Clay company that is working with me does a phenomenal job, all on archival, 100% cotton paper with archival inks. And these inks are phenomenal. I'm surprised at the color matches that they're allowed to do. It's absolutely amazing. It's like having the original piece in your office or your home. That's just too beautiful. I can see so many places that that Sandia Mountain painting would, would fit. So many places. Mm. Altogether, now you've been painting for your whole life essentially. Altogether, how many actual originals would you say you've painted? Have you ever counted? No, <laughs> I have not counted. There are, most of my new work is archived. Uh, so I do have an inventory system Matter of fact, each individual original piece has its own QR code that when you scan it after you purchase it, it goes directly to a hidden URL in my website. So it guarantees uh, the artist, it guarantees the year of when it's made, it's, it's, it's absolutely documented. Um, but as far as how many paintings I've created uh, in my lifetime, I have not documented. I know last time when I was in Virginia, I did. I made 27 pieces of art in 32 days. That was my accelerated apotheosis uh, exhibition at the Norfolk Botanical Garden. And I know when I when I really want to, I could put the pedal to the metal, and I could be making five paintings, or at least working on five paintings daily. That's extraordinary. Hold on to that thought for a second. My mom's calling again. 
Hi, Mom. <laughs> Hi, Mom. <laughs> Two most important things. Time and money. Anything that wastes both doesn't get to do it twice. What is this? If you take this home and do what it says. My name is Shavings, and I want to play a game with you. I'm not gonna hurt you, Eli. I really do like you. technology out there that a lot of people are not aware of yet. It's called non-fungible tokens. For an artist, this is a revolutionary thing. Why is it revolutionary? It's because an artist like DanielCathalinas.com, Dan see how I worked that in? DanielCathalinas.com can take his original artwork and actually sell it. And then you say, well he sold it one time so he might have get a five, ten thousand, twenty thousand dollar sale, fifty thousand off of that one single art item, he sold it once. But when you connect a non-fungible token, it's kind of like crypto coins. When you connect those crypto coins, those non-fungible tokens to that piece of art, now someone can purchase the non-fungible token again and again and again and again and you can, you can trade it. It's kind of like trading stock. You can sell this stock again and again and again. And the artist makes money on it every single time. So we no longer, if an artist takes advantage of this, we should no longer have starving artists. Instead, we should be able to support artists, like Daniel, who create extraordinary work. Have you got any non-fungible tokenized artwork yet? Not yet, but I'm dreaming it up. Uh, I've been thinking about it and reading about it for a bit now, and I'm very interested to try my chance at it. It's also got me thinking, and this is what I did work on, was the idea of what you just said was, was fractional equity. So in other words, um, Picasso, when he used to sell his artwork, uh, he would have, every time it gets resold, he would get a payment he would get a percentage on that resale. And as the values went up, he would get a percentage of the sale. And that's exactly what I'm doing with my current work physically, not the NFTs, uh, but they are actually inventoried and there is a contract involving that very method. So things that they've been doing in Europe for years have never reached the United States. Now, they are doing uh, fractional equity on large arts, large artworks or important artworks like Van Gogh and a major company would buy a Van Gogh or something like that and, and split it all into their subsidiaries and they would each get a fractional equity as they sell it. Um, this has been going on for years in America corporately, but not privately. And, you know, musicians do get paid uh, every time they get played on the radio, right? It's copyrighted. There's a... Uh, there's a contract involved. Well, same thing with artwork. That's what my process has been for the past year now. And I found that my patrons are very excited to do that. They have nothing to lose. Matter of fact, they have everything to gain because it's an inventory system that really um, has many details about where things are made, what they're, who they're made by, and what the values are. And that's really the beauty of, of uh, what I call TAR, my my terms of agreement and record. I think it's amazing because hundreds of years ago, artists could ver barely survive, like Van Gogh. 
I mean, if my history is correct, he was able to sell like one piece of art in his entire life. That is correct. But today, you're able to sell artwork, make a living off of it, whether it's meager or rich. I mean, Thomas Kincaid became a millionaire. So it is very, very possible in today's world, especially when you take advantage of fractional, the fractionals and the NFTs, like you said, that you could make a significant living as an artist. Yes, yeah. And, you know, Van Gogh, for instance, he had a brother, Theo, that funded him, that basically kept him alive and kept food in his mouth and heat on and, and there's room. Uh, probably it was coal or a furnace of some sort at the time. But yeah, he only sold one painting in his lifetime. And now we look at him as a modern master. It's very interesting. Many years ago, I went to MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and I looked at Starry Night, and uh, it was just me in the room alone with it. And I had a chance to really observe it and, and take close look at Van Gogh's work. And then many years later, I went to MoMA, and it's encased in glass, it has a stanchion around it, and there's about 50 people speaking 20 different languages in front of that painting, staring at it, getting pictures of it, looking at it, being excited about it. Um, that, that's very fascinating to me, that an artist in his lifetime could barely feed himself off his art, and then many years later he's revered. So that comes to my mind, what we think about artists is the importance and the value after their death, or shall we support living artists? artists that are alive today that are doing something at the moment and i really came in touch with that with working with brooklyn water art uh, brooklyn waterfront artist coalition known as bwac and one of their main slogans was support living artists and that's true that's true if we like it we just might want to buy it and not wait till the person's gone and some major corporation to pick it up i completely agree especially in the art whether it's film or painting or music, you need to support these people. They contribute to our culture. They preserve memories. They create that, that identity years later. I can't think of the correct words at the moment, but that's the most that's gonna come out of my head right now. I've got just a few minutes left, so I just wanna tell everybody at home, remember to go to Daniel Kathalinas. That is spelled Daniel, D-A-N-I-E-L, K-A-T-H. A L N A L Y N A S K A T H A L Y N A S dot com. Daniel Kathalinas dot com and get a copy for yourself. Help support the artists who make the stuff that you see every day. We're surrounded by art, whether it's in a magazine or a website or a street sign of all things, it's a piece of art. And if we don't support those who create the beauty, well, where would it be? So let's support those artists. My name is Jeffrey Hill. I'm the host of the show, and I can't wait to share my next guest with you. Until then, I love you all.